In this video, I'm going to talk about how the accounting for pension plans and other post-retirement benefit plans are similar and different. Now, when I say pension plans, I'm talking specifically about defined benefit pension plans. Those are the ones where the employee works for a certain amount of years for the company, and then in retirement, they're entitled to income from that company for the rest of their life. When I'm talking about other post-retirement benefit plans, I'm talking about things where, for example, the employer offers the employee health insurance after they've retired, or life insurance, dental coverage, vision coverage, and so forth. Okay, so I wanna talk about the similarities first, and then we'll get to the differences. So in both cases, whether we're talking about a defined benefit pension plan where the retiree's gonna be getting income, or we're talking about some kind of post-retirement benefit plan where they're gonna get health insurance, in each case, the employer needs to make estimates about what is gonna be the cost of those future benefits. And then they're going to discount that cost to the present value, because those costs are incurring in the future, to measure the employer's obligation. So in each case, whether we're talking about accounting for a pension plan or some other type of post-retirement benefit plan, we're ultimately gonna be trying to calculate the employer's obligation, okay? So in the future, they're gonna incur some costs, so what is the present value of those costs? Now, when it comes to the balance sheet, this obligation, which when we're talking about a pension plan, the projected benefit obligation is the one that's gonna affect the balance sheet. Okay, when we're talking about other post-retirement benefit plan, uh, we're talking about this APBO, accumulated post-retirement benefit obligation, that's gonna affect the balance sheet. Okay, so in each case, this obligation that we've calculated is gonna be netted with the pension plan's assets, okay, the assets that the, the employer has set aside to later uh, to pay out these benefits and report it as a single amount on the balance sheet. Okay, so with a pension plan, you would not just see a line that says projected benefit obligation, PBO. It would be netted with the plan assets. Similarly, with other post-retirement benefit plans, you're not just gonna see APBO on the balance sheet, it's gonna be netted with the plan assets. Now, if the amount of the obligation is higher than the amount of the plan assets, there's gonna be a liability recorded on the balance sheet. So remember, this is just a single net amount. So obligations higher than plan assets, we've got a liability. If the plan assets are higher than the obligation, then we're going to have an asset on the balance sheet. Okay, so this is working the same way, whether we got a pension plan, uh, other post-retirement benefit plan, and similarly, on the income statement, we're gonna report the periodic expense. So on the income statement, if it was a pension plan, we're talking about pension expense. We're, uh, we're talking about other post-retirement benefit plan, we'd have post-retirement benefit expense. Okay, so, and I've got other videos where I show you how to calculate or make the journal entries and so forth. Now, when it comes to differences between the accounting for pension plans and accounting for other post-retirement benefit plans, there are a number of differences. Now, when it comes to post-retirement healthcare plans, the company not only needs to estimate the future healthcare costs, they also have to estimate the company's share of those costs. Okay, because the government Right, so let's say we're talking about an employee uh, for, for a company in the United States. The United States government might be sharing a portion of the healthcare cost, paying a portion of that employee's healthcare cost once they have retired. So you've got, you got really, if we think about the share of costs, we've got, we've got maybe, uh, oh, let me draw this a little better. So if we think about the share of costs, maybe this amount is covered by the government. Uh, this amount is gonna be covered by the employee. And then we have this amount here might be the employer's share of those future healthcare costs. So, so basically the employer has to not only estimate what is gonna be the, what's gonna happen with healthcare costs going forward, but also what's gonna be their portion of the, the retiree's uh, healthcare costs. Now, another difference is that when we come to accounting for pensions, pension benefits are usually a set dollar limit. Okay, there's a formula that says, look, you worked this amount of years for the company, this was your higher salary, multiply that by 3%, 4%, whatever, the company has some formula, and that's the annual pension benefit for that employee who's now retired, right? And so it's a little easier to predict. With healthcare costs, we don't know necessarily what those healthcare costs will be. We can come up with estimates, but there's no upper bound. There's no max amount where it's like, okay, it's not gonna go beyond this, right? The employee might have serious health problems, Okay, in their retirement. Now, another difference is that pension benefits generally increase with each year of service. So if we think about the formula as being the years of service, the, the calculate the uh, pension benefit for an employee for, under a defined benefit plan, if we've got years of service times their highest salary, 
that they ever had, or maybe they averaged their five best years, highest salary times, let's say 3.5%. Uh, let's say that that's used to calculate their, their pension benefit in retirement. The more years they've worked, the more years of service, the higher will be the, the benefit, right? Because if you increase this number here, holding all else constant, uh, they're going to have a higher benefit. And so, but other post-retirement benefit plans don't generally work that way. They're usually all or nothing. And what I mean by all or nothing is it might say, look, if you've worked for this company at least 10 years, okay, if you've at least worked for this company at least 10 years uh, and you retire from this company at age 55 or older, so if you if you work for the company at least 10 years, you re you qualify for health care benefits from this company when you retire uh, for, the, for the rest of your life. So then it's like if you only work there nine years, you get nothing. If you work there 10 years, you qualify for the health care benefits. If you say, well, I want to work there 12 years. Well, you don't get any additional health care, but you, you still just get you, you either qualify by getting the 10 years of service uh, for the health care benefits or you, you don't. OK, whereas, again, with the pension benefits, we said the more years of service you have, the higher your, your benefit. Now, in terms of the beneficiaries, when it comes to a pension plan, we're talking about the monthly income uh, that the retiree is going to get. Generally, so obviously the retiree will be entitled to that income. Sometimes if the retiree dies, uh, in some cases their spouse might be entitled uh, to continue receiving a portion of the payments, uh, but generally not dependents like their children uh, under a pension plan. However, under other post-retirement benefit plans like healthcare, there might be cases where not only the retiree and their spouse, but also potentially their children in some cases might qualify for health care coverage uh, from the company. Now, in the United States, so I don't know about this particular point about other countries, but in the United States, pensions tend to be better funded than other post-retirement benefit plans, like, for example, uh, with, with health care. And I keep mentioning health care because health care is the most common type of other post-retirement benefit. So pensions tend to be better funded. And the reason being, if an employer makes a contribution to plan assets uh, for, for a pension plan, they get an immediate tax deduction for that contribution. However, when it comes to other post-retirement benefits plans, like, for example, health care, the employer does not get an immediate tax deduction for a contribution. They only get the tax deduction when, when in the future when the, empo the employee who's then a retiree gets the benefits. So therefore, companies don't have an incentive to properly fund the plan. Okay, so you you might see a other post-retirement health care plan that is unfunded or it really uh, has very little plan assets because the companies aren't getting a tax deduction. They don't have an incentive to like pre-fund that plan. Now, another difference, okay, between accounting for pensions and other post-retirement plans has to do with amortization of prior service costs or prior service credits. Remember, prior service costs are when a pension plan is amended and it grants additional benefits and that for people who have already been working for the firm, they're going to get more benefits uh, for work that they've already done, right? Or prior service credit would actually be they get less benefit. But uh, let's stick with prior service costs here. So we're amortizing the prior service costs. When it comes to pensions, so you, you the company granted uh, some change to the pension plan that that means that they're going to get more benefits, uh, you know, which we call prior service costs. We are going to amortize the prior service costs over the average remaining service life of active employees. So if you say, well, you know what, the active employees on average are going to work about 17.3 more years, then you grant some benefit that's like I don't know, 60 million dollars of benefit. Uh, you would amortize that over the 17.3 years. If we're talking about this was an amendment to a pension plan. But if it's an amendment to an other post-retirement benefit plan, like something that provides health care, and we have prior service costs because the plan was amended and that granted these additional benefits, in that case, we would amortize the prior service costs over the time to remain uh, the time remaining to full eligibility. And if you say, well, what does that mean? What's the difference? Let's say that we say, okay, you know what? The average uh, remaining service life is, of employees is 17.3 years, but the average time, of, or the time for them to actually be eligible, to get fully eligible for healthcare benefits and retirement is 12 years. So if we said, okay, well, we think they're going to work 17.3 more years, but but to actually get full uh, fully eligible for the healthcare benefits, they just need to work 12 more years. Then we'd amortize that prior service cost over the 12 years. Now, if you're wondering, 
Uh, what about amortization of a net gain or net loss that goes outside the corridor? So uh, check out my videos on corridor amortization and dealing with net gain or loss uh, if you're not familiar with this term. Uh, but if you say, hey, what about that? Is that the same thing? No. When you amortize a net gain or a net loss that goes outside the corridor, okay, when you amortize that, whether we're talking about a pension plan or an other post-retirement benefit plan, in each case, that net gain or net loss that's outside the corridor, when you go to amortize that, that would be amortized over the average remaining service life of the company's active employees.